Planet America's fake news. What the hell is going on here? Hello, and welcome to a very special edition of Planet America. I'm John Barron. I'm Shazda Chidella. This week, it's on. Not quite. Can we just, uh... Yes, that's better. Yeah, not as punchy, though. <laughs> Some members of the Democratic Party began calling for it less than four months after President Trump took office. I rise today, Mr Speaker, to call for the impeachment of the President of the United States of America. That was back on the day that Special Counsel Robert Mueller was first appointed to investigate Russian interference in the 2016 election and possible collusion or obstruction by President Trump. We saw how that turned out. Well, that guy there was slow out of the gate, John. Really? Maxine Waters beat him by two months! Very lethargic. Well, two and a half years and about a million other years later, President Trump is again suspected of seeking foreign help to win an election. And after opposing impeachment all that time, Democratic House Speaker Nancy Pelosi finally yielded this week. The House of Representatives moving forward with an official impeachment inquiry. The actions of the Trump presidency revealed dishonorable fact of the president's betrayal of his oath of office, betrayal of our national security, and betrayal of the integrity of our elections. Now, what this means, mm. we're going to have to see. Because well, the way she puts it, it sounds pretty bad. Yeah, all those flags. <laughs> but the, the, the guy who's supposedly leading this process, Judiciary Committee Chair Jerry Nadler, he mm. said they'd started the impeachment process months ago. This is formal impeach impeachment proceedings. I think Pelosi mm. has a better PR team. Yeah, <laughs> better set design anyway. <laughs> there is a lot to unpack in all of this, and that can only mean one thing. Break it down. Well, it all began last weekend with reports that a US intelligence agent had sounded the alarm over something President Trump had said to a foreign leader. This morning, the Washington Post reporting that the genesis of a whistleblower's complaint allegedly involves the president promising something to a foreign leader that left the Trump administration official unnerved and deeply concerned. Well, that whistleblower's complaint was put in front of the acting director of national intelligence, Joseph Maguire, who was then blocked from passing the complaint on to members of Congress, as he is meant to do, by White House lawyers. Further reports then revealed the complaint raised concerns about, among other things, a call between President Trump and the President of Ukraine, the former stand-up comedian Volodymyr Zelensky, in which Trump asked for Ukraine to investigate his potential political rival Joe Biden and his son Hunter, at a time, of course, that Trump had ordered $400 million worth of US aid to Ukraine to be withheld. Now, remarkably, President Trump did not deny it. In fact, he then turned his attack on the Bidens. What Biden did is a disgrace. What his son did is a disgrace. The son took money from Ukraine. The son took money from China. And that's where this started to sound an awful lot like Russiagate 2.0. Was President Trump really seeking foreign help in finding dirt on a rival to win an election again? It's an abuse of power. It undermines our national security. It violates his oath of office, and it strikes at the heart of the sworn responsibility of the president a president has to put national interest before personal interest. President Trump said there was nothing wrong with the phone call. It's a joke. Impeachment for that? Well, after Nancy Pelosi announced an impeachment inquiry, the White House released a declassified partial transcript in the form of a memo, not the full call. In it, President Trump talks about American aid to Ukraine. Then he asks for a favour. He mentions CloudStrike and the server and that they say Ukraine has it. Zelensky replies, all investigations will be done openly and candidly, whatever that means. Now, that of course all relates to the 2016 election. And bear in mind, this phone call took place the very day after Special Counsel Robert Mueller testified before Congress in late July. CloudStrike is the cybersecurity firm that determined the Democratic National Committee had been hacked by Russia, 
who then forwarded the emails to WikiLeaks to release them and damage Clinton. The DNC didn't give the FBI their original computer server. They gave them a copy of the server. And ever since, some have been convinced that Hillary Clinton's famous 30,000 deleted emails must be on that server, which some also believe is in Ukraine. Well, this looks very much like a case of Trump falling for what is essentially an internet conspiracy theory. He made a similar claim to the Associated Press in 2017, but in reality, CloudStrike was founded by a Russian-American, not a rich Ukrainian, and they're based in Sunnyvale, California, not Ukraine. But here's the bit that is causing the biggest headache for Donald Trump. He then raises the issue of Joe Biden and his son Hunter. Defenders of Donald Trump point out there is no overt quid pro quo. Trump isn't saying, find those Clinton emails or dirt on Joe Biden and Hunter Biden, or I won't give you any more military aid. But others say, in this context, it is more than strongly implied. It's two leaders talking about what they want from each other. And Trump wants an investigation into his rivals. And that could amount to an illegal campaign contribution. Or more seriously, it could amount to an unconstitutional abuse of power by an American president, endangering national security and the security of an ally, Ukraine, engaged in a conflict with Russia, all for Trump's own political gain. And it turns out, according to a former advisor to the Ukrainian president, a bloke named Serhiy Leshenko, it was clear that Trump would only talk with Zelensky if they discussed the Biden case. Meanwhile, as luck would have it, President Zelensky and President Trump were both in New York at the UN General Assembly this week. They appeared in a joint press conference yesterday and reporters asked Zelensky if he had actually launched an investigation into the Bidens. We have independent country and independent general security. I can't push anyone, you know? That's it. Yeah, well, that'll come as a bit of a disappointment to President Trump's unpaid personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, who has been Trump's point man on all of this. In the memo, based on the phone call, President Trump says Giuliani is a highly respected man who very much knows what's happening in the Biden case, and he is a very capable guy. Well, Rudy's role in this is very interesting. He doesn't work for the government. He is Trump's friend and unpaid personal attorney. President Trump was asked... What is Rudy up to? What he's out is he wants to find out where did this Russian witch hunt that you people really helped perpetrate, where did it start? How come it started? And as for Rudy, he claims that he was asked to contact Ukrainian officials by the US State Department. By the way, do you have any idea that the State Department... So then you know the lie. Okay, hold on. Shut up, Rudy. Shut up. Okay, hold on. Shut up. You don't Everybody. know what you're talking about. Ooh. Chris, You Chris, don't know Chris, what you're talking Chris. about, idiot. <laughs> that was one of Rudy's more relaxed media appearances this week. Look, it is an important impeachment question, though. Is the president deploying his personal lawyer to conduct foreign policy for his personal benefit, or is Giuliani representing the State Department? You can already see where this one's going. I never talked to a Ukrainian official until the State Department called me and asked me to do it. And then I reported every conversation back to them. And uh, Laura, I'm a pretty good lawyer, just a country lawyer. But it's all here, right here. Someone's getting their phone record subpoenaed. <laughs> Although, to be fair to Rudy, that was some of his better work recently. I'm not sure what he was thinking back in May when his defense for Trump was, we're not meddling in an election. We're meddling in an investigation. So much better. And there's nothing illegal <laughs> about it. Somebody could say it's improper. <laughs> Even that effort was better than this one at the beginning of the week. Did you t ask the Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden? No, actually, I didn't. I asked the Ukraine to investigate the allegations that there was interference in the election of 2016 by the Ukrainians for the benefit of Hillary Clinton for which there already is a court finding. You never asked anything about Hunter Biden. You never asked anything about Joe Biden. The only thing I asked about Joe Biden is to get to the bottom of how it was that Lutsenko, who was appointed, right. dismissed the case against Antak. So you did ask Ukraine to look into Joe Biden? Of course I did. You just said you didn't. No, I didn't ask him to look into Joe Biden. I asked him to look into the allegations that related to my client.
I think Chris Cuomo spoke for all of us then. Mm, yeah, I, I wasn't talking about Joe Biden. I was talking about Joe Biden. <laughs> Look, tell us, what is this all about? What does Donald Trump want Rudy Giuliani and the Ukrainians to find out? OK, it's all about Joe Biden's kind of shady son, Hunter. Fresh from being drummed out of the Navy Reserve for failing a cocaine test, Hunter landed on his feet with a tidy little part-time gig at the Ukrainian gas company Burisma, being paid $50,000 a month to focus on corporate governance best practices. I'd say best practice for corporate governance would be to sack the 50 grand a month dead weight, but that's just me. Anyway, people immediately identified how dubious Hunter's position was, but there is a long line of moochers profiteering from their more successful relatives in US politics. Also, this company, Burisma, was as dodgy as Hunter. It was already under investigation by Ukraine's Prosecutor General, and that there is when Hunter joined up. Now, a couple of years later, Joe Biden showed up to Ukraine with a big, shiny billion dollar a check and he's got a cute little anecdote he likes to tell about it. I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting a billion dollars. I said, you're not getting a billion. I'm going to be leaving here. And I think it was, what, six hours? I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Well, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. I fired the prosecutor. <laughs> now, you'll be surprised to hear that Joe's anecdote is not 100% true. Joe actually showed up in December and the prosecutor got fired three months later, but he still got fired. And guess what happened then? In September 2016, the courts concluded that no criminal procedures should be taken against Burisma's owner, Zachevsky, and the replacement prosecutor dropped the investigations. How about that? So Trump says... But what he said is that he wouldn't give, I think it was billions of dollars to Ukraine unless they fired the prosecutor who was looking at his son and his son's company, the company that his son worked with. And that's a very dishonest thing. Except pretty much every responsible journalist says things like, no evidence has surfaced that Biden acted inappropriately. Well, I'm not a journalist and I'm not responsible. So let's keep digging to the wall! Big, beautiful world. Well, the first question is, just how bad is this Shokin guy that Biden wanted sacked? Well, according to the Washington Post fact checker, no one really liked him very much. Not America, not their Western allies, not non-government organizations like the IMF or the World Bank. Furthermore, Bloomberg says that the plan to push for Shokin's dismissal didn't even come from Biden. It came from officials at the American embassy in Kiev, and that is according to a person with direct knowledge of the situation, whoever that is. I hope it's not him. But we can find some real-time evidence for this, though. Back in 2015, Reuters then was reporting that the US ambassador had called out Shokin's office for openly and aggressively undermining reform, and Ukrainian reformers were demanding his ouster. Also, in 2016, a Ukrainian anti-corruption group called for Shokin's resignation for intimidating reformers and a failure to investigate corruption crimes, including the Burisma case, Hunter Biden's company. And in 2016, the IMF also was saying that progress was so slow in fighting Ukrainian corruption, it was hard to see how the IMF-supported program could even continue. Okay, so maybe Shokin was a terrible prosecutor and he needed to go. But Surely Biden was the wrong guy to move against. A prosecutor who was investigating his son and the company that his son works for. Absolutely, if there was an investigation. Because according to Bloomberg, when Biden made his ultimatum, the probe into Hunter Biden's company, Burisma Holdings, and its owner, Zlachevsky, had been long dormant. And not because of pressure from Americans, it was shelved by Ukrainian prosecutors in 2014 and 2015. In fact, far from being a tough prosecutor, as Trump claimed, Shokin took no action to pursue cases against Lachevsky throughout 2015. But how would Bloomberg know that? Well, they spoke to Shokin's deputy, Casco, who resigned in February 2016, wait for it, citing corruption and lawlessness in the prosecutor general's office. But do we really trust Casco? 
in 2016 we did, when Casco resigned, the American ambassador called him a champion of reforms in the Prosecutor General's office. And they said that his resignation will interrupt the progress of reforms in Ukraine. Okay, so that guy is saying that Shokin buried the investigation. But Shokin disagrees. He told The Hill that before he was fired, he had made specific plans for the investigation that included interrogations of all members of the executive board, including Hunter Biden. Now that is interesting. So if you look back at that timeline from before, there was over a year between then and then when Shokin was around when he could have spoken to the board or Hunter Biden if he wanted to, yet he never seemed to find the time for some reason. That is slower work than Robert Mueller. In fact, there is no evidence of Shokin doing any investigating in Burisma during this period at all, which might explain Casco quitting. But don't take my word for it. In December 2014, American officials wrote a letter warning Ukraine about negative consequences over its failure to assist the UK in investigating Zlachevsky, the Burisma case, Hunter Biden, as in America itself under Joe Biden was complaining about Ukraine not investigating his son's company. And in 2015, the American embassy was added again, complaining that Shokin not only did not support investigations into corruption, be undermined prosecutors working on legitimate corruption cases, singling out, you guessed it, the Zlachevsky. The, the, why is he, what's he called something like Lichadello? These bloody Ukrainians! Anyway, the Zlachevsky investigation. It's the case involving Hunter Biden's company, okay? And he said Shokin sent letters to Zlachevsky's attorneys attesting that there was no case against him. This is in 2015, before Biden had done anything. And while according to Shokin, he was making specific plans to investigate them. So those US complaints go right in the middle there. And by the way, a little side, what do you think that investigation was actually about? Do you think it was about Hunter Biden being dodgy? Uh -huh. There are a few investigations actually. There was one into the granting of exclusive gas licenses to Zlachevsky when he was a minister before 2012. And there are a few investigations of tax evasion and money laundering. And according to Lutsenko, who was the prosecutor after Shokin, the money laundering issue occurred months before Hunter Biden joined the Burisma board. And Lutsenko said, Biden was definitely not involved. We do not have any grounds to think that there was any wrongdoing starting from 2014. Okay, so the Burisma dodginess didn't involve Hunter Biden. In fact, it was before he joined the board. The investigation into his company seemed to be buried by the Ukrainian prosecutor and America specifically complained about that. And when Biden asked for the prosecutor, who was not actually investigating his son, to be sacked, people thought it was a great idea. So I really don't think... Joe Biden is the one that did a very, very bad thing. Although there, there is one more little thing. Back to Red Trump. And then he said he never spoke to his son, but then he also said long before that he did speak to his son. So he lied again. And he's right. This is what Biden said to Fox's Pete Ducey. How many times have you ever spoken to your son about his overseas business dealings? I've never spoken to my son about his overseas business dealings. But Hunter Biden told the New Yorker that Joe did discuss Burisma with him once. Joe said, I hope you know what you're doing. And Hunter said, I do. Got him! Look, I, I know it's not much, but Trump's having a tough week, okay? I thought it would help him out. Apart from Biden having a son who's dodgily profiting from his career, lying to Pete Ducey is pretty much the only thing I can find that he's done wrong. Big, beautiful world. Well, I hope you're keeping up with all of that. There will be a quiz later. Earlier today, the New York Times reported that the whistleblower is in fact a CIA officer who was detailed to work at the White House. The paper didn't completely identify the whistleblower further, apart from saying that he is in fact a he, and also speculating that they are a Europe or Ukraine expert. The formal complaint was also released earlier today by Congress and potentially the most damaging piece of new information in that is the very strong suggestion of a cover-up. 
Officials told the whistleblower they had been told to, quote, lock down the transcript of Trump's call with Zelensky. And that on the order of White House lawyers, the transcript was concealed on a computer system directly managed by the National Security Council. The complaint details the concern some White House and intelligence officials expressed over the whole situation and importantly, the complainant's characterization of the phone call of July 25 is very accurate when compared to the partial transcript that was released yesterday. The complaint also alleged, by the way, that Trump was pushing Giuliani onto the Ukrainian president as far back as April. All right, well, we have got some very top-notch reaction for you in a moment, but first, there has been a lot of talk about impeachment this week and a lot of confusion as to what that actually is. So let's find out. Impeachment is weird. In 1998, President Bill Clinton was impeached, but he stayed president. In 1868, President Andrew Johnson was impeached, and he also stayed president. In 1974, President Richard Nixon was not impeached, but stopped being president. Under the US Constitution, impeachment is the process by which the president can be removed from office by the Congress for treason, bribery or other high crimes and misdemeanours, without saying what that actually is, so Congress gets to decide. Now an impeachment inquiry into President Trump is underway, the House Judiciary Committee will have to decide whether impeachment is warranted based on their own inquiries and those of other committees. They'll hold hearings, call witnesses, get lawyers to ask questions. It will look a lot like a court case, but it's not. They're not independent prosecutors, they're politicians. And almost certainly they will act like politicians and vote to impeach President Trump. If they do, the full House of Representatives will then vote and Democrats can pass those articles of impeachment with a simple majority. And they have that in the House and all the committees, so they could do that tomorrow. At that point, President Donald Trump would have been impeached. But let's have another look at the Constitution. The President shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of blah blah crimes etc etc. So impeachment just by itself is not enough. You need to convict as well. And that happens in the Senate. In that impeachment trial, all 100 senators effectively sit as a jury, presided over by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, in this case, John Roberts. But here's the rub. 67 of those senators, two thirds, have to vote in favor of impeachment in order to convict the president. Otherwise, he's acquitted. And Democrats can only muster 47 Senate votes. Right now, there is no way 20 Republicans will flip on President Trump. That's pretty much what saved Bill Clinton. I want to say again to the American people how profoundly sorry I am. Democrats stayed behind him. Republicans could only get 55 votes at best. He survived. Also, Andrew Johnson avoided a two-thirds vote against him by a single vote. Nixon resigned to avoid certain impeachment and conviction because there was indisputable evidence that he had lied and covered up Watergate. They had the tapes to prove it. Because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Which brings us back to the Trump impeachment inquiry. To remove this president or force him to resign, Democrats will need to come up with something big. Treason, bribery, high crimes and misdemeanors. Maybe about Ukraine, maybe about Russia and obstruction of justice, maybe about Trump's business dealings. But even if there is a tape, a smoking gun, remember, the Senate isn't really a jury either. Just like the Democrats in the House, they're just a bunch of politicians and they tend to vote along party lines even more so now than in 1974 or 1999. So right now, Donald Trump can expect to be impeached by the House and acquitted by the Senate and stay president at least until January 2021. Well, this is one of those stories where it's pretty good to get a couple of different perspectives mm, on all of this. Not every perspective, though. That is treason. It's treason pure and simple. And the penalty for treason under the US code is death. That was Republican <laughs> primary candidate Bill Weld showing why his recent poll result of 2%
overrated him. <laughs> well, we'll speak to a former Watergate prosecutor shortly, but first, we've got the former Attorney General of the state of Florida with us. Yeah, Bill McCollum also served in the US Congress for 20 years and he helped lead the impeachment of Bill Clinton. Bill McCollum, welcome to Planet America. I'm happy to be with you. Thank you. This is a fast-moving story, of course, but how much trouble is President Trump in right now? Well, I think that the president is going to see the Democrats in the House go through a series of hearings and keep trying to beat the drum for impeachment for quite some time. Uh, the most recent revelation that came out with regard to the whistleblower that told um, about what he overheard five or six other people say with regard to this phone call to the president of Ukraine uh, itself is damning if you believe everything in it is true. Uh, the problem with it is it's inconsistent with the transcript uh, version that came out yesterday of that call. And in addition to that, it is completely hearsay. So there are going to be a lot of other questions that the committee will ask. Uh, and there are several committees, by the way, involved in this, uh, six of them to be precise, which makes it a very different kind of impeachment process uh, than what we went through when I was uh, an impeachment trial manager for President Clinton's impeachment trial. So is this now a showdown over White House tapes and other documents like Watergate was? Well, I would think so. I think uh, there will be uh, openness about a lot of this, I would hope. Uh, I don't know what's in these uh, tr additional transcripts or what's in it, if there is additional material there. But all of that generally comes out in America when we have investigations uh, of a president or of anyone else. Uh, and I don't know how incriminating it actually is, if it is at all. Uh, we tend to think uh, when you are in the Washington circle that everything is what you are viewing and how you're seeing it. Uh, and, and yet, right now, the public's not at all interested in this. Uh, they hear a little bit about it, but so far as I can determine, uh, it doesn't look like the type of thing that would get him removed from office. It might get him impeached. It might get the Democrats to get enough votes to put it through. But we have to wait and see. It's premature to judge this. It's way premature since there's so much unknown about it. Now, according to Nancy Pelosi, the House has begun an impeachment inquiry and everything has changed. But according to Republican Doug Collins, they haven't taken a formal vote yet in the House, so nothing has actually changed legally at all. What's the truth? Well, the truth is that in order to impeach the president, the House Judiciary Committee has to receive direction from the full House, or should at least. I'm, I'm sure there's some standing policy that's been around for a long time on that. but. Uh, that hasn't happened. There has not been a vote of the full U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, at the end of the day, it's the Judiciary Committee that brings forward impeachment articles uh, if they are brought forward, and then they go to the full House for a vote. Uh, that's like an indictment if they vote to impeach, and then those charges go to the Senate for trial. Uh, most people don't think at this point in time the president would be convicted by the Senate, and maybe even the matters would be dismissed. I know we had the goods, if you want to call it that, on President Clinton without question. I think most of the American public understood that, but they didn't want to see the president removed. And that cost us the ability to actually get witnesses we wanted to try in that case on the floor of the Senate. We had a much abbreviated process from what we contemplated as impeachment trial managers. And at the end of the day, uh, of course, we did not get a conviction, even though it was very clear that he had committed the crimes if you were taking him to a, a court of law in the United States and he was being tried for perjury and obstruction of justice. He, he would have been convicted, but not uh, removed from the, from the presidency by the Senate in this case. During your announcement, Nancy Pelosi referred to this moment. Then I have an Article 2 where I have the right to do whatever I want as president, but I don't even talk about that. When the president is literally claiming they have the right to do whatever they want, isn't that a good time to consider impeachment? Well, it's a statement. It's, a, it's something he doesn't have the right to do, and he knows he doesn't have the right to do that. We, he's been restrained already by the courts, as was President Obama, and every president before him. Somewhere along the way, they've ordered something, done something, which a, the United States Supreme Court or some lower court has sent, found uh, to be beyond their powers. That's not unusual. Uh, his boldness and brashness and some of his tweets tend to get him into trouble. So I don't think that itself is a significant factor. But she's aggravated. A lot of Democrats are aggravated. A lot of people are. They just don't like the way he behaves and generally how he conducts himself. Uh, but from a policy standpoint, the economy is very good here. Uh, most of what he's done from the conservative standpoint with regard to the U.S. Supreme Court appointments and many other things, uh, politically in that sense and policy-wise, he's very popular. And I think that were it not for his own 
uh, personality and the kind of attitude that exists out there among some of the people, uh, he wouldn't be in any kind of trouble at this point at all. And he may not be, as it turns uh, on this, because generally voters in the United States don't like to see the president removed from office, as we found in the Clinton impeachment case. They don't want that, and the polls right now show that in America. What would it take for 20 Senate Republicans to vote to convict Donald Trump? Or could it be, as he famously said, he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and not lose support? Well, I think it would be difficult unless the American public turned against the president and some of his base turned, which is difficult to see right now. Uh, but I do think that if there were a conclusion by those listening to the facts that uh, he committed a crime of bribery, for example, which is uh, actionable and is it's, it's bribery, treason, and high crimes and misdemeanors to be impeachable in the, under our Constitution. If, in fact, he, he would be uh, convicted or could be convicted in a civil court, criminal court, I should say, of, of the crime of bribery, uh, then perhaps that would do it. Um, I don't think we're there yet. I don't see that at this point. Um, would anything short of that allow uh, Republican senators? Maybe one or two, but not 20. It would be it, it just, we're, we're speculating now. My guess is that he does not uh, even get impeached at the end of the day because it's going to become very uncomfortable for quite a few Democrats in the House who are in districts that are strongly Trump districts. And they, there are several of them in that category. So they need a majority they, to just send the case over to the Senate. They need, a, you know, 218. So that's going to be a tough slog for them. Uh, and it's going to depend largely upon whether the general public becomes convinced that something really bad enough to convict is here, especially remembering the elections not that far away. And most of the time, that's the way the Americans want to decide these things as they see them very politically. Bill McCollum, many thanks indeed for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you. And for another perspective, we're going to speak to Nick Ackerman. He is a former assistant U.S. district attorney and federal prosecutor who worked on the Watergate inquiry under special counsels Archibald Cox and Leon Jaworski. Nick Ackerman, thank you very much indeed for your time as well. Well, thank you for having me. So, based on what we know from the memo of the phone call and now the whistleblower's complaint, does this justify an impeachment inquiry? Oh, there's no question it justifies an impeachment inquiry. I mean, I think what it really suggests is that there is a lot of other investigation to do. Uh, if you look at both of these documents, clearly this was not the first time that anybody from Ukraine was approached by either Trump or someone in the administration about investigating Joe Biden and his son. Uh, we know there was an earlier phone call in April. Uh, we know that Rudy Giuliani met with one of um, the president of the Ukraine's uh, associates in Madrid. Uh, we knew that there were other contacts. Uh, we also know that, at least from the press reports, uh, that a lot of the national security people really didn't want Trump to go through with this phone call uh, in July because they were fearful he would do exactly what he wound up doing, uh, was basically pressing uh, the president of Ukraine uh, to investigate his um, chief rival for the presidency this year. So there's a lot of people here to talk to. Uh, there's also a lot of details to run down on exactly why it was uh, the 400 million that the Congress um, appropriated for the defense of Ukraine uh, was not provided to Ukraine in a timely manner. Uh, looking at those documents, uh, who was told to withhold that money, where that all went. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot for the House Judiciary Committee or the Intelligence Committee to look at uh, to put together a case if they're going to bring impeachment. So given that Rudy Giuliani is notionally Trump's lawyer, will privilege protect their communications? Well, first of all, I don't think it's at all privileged. Uh, there is an exception to attorney-client privilege for crime or fraud. Uh, and clearly this was relating to a criminal act that had to do with essentially um, extorting the government of Ukraine to provide what could have been a phony information uh, to Trump in order to use against uh, Joe Biden. Um, so I don't think there's any privilege here. And on top of it all, I think they've waived a good bit of that privilege just by virtue of Rudy Giuliani going on television and supposedly explaining what he did, some of which were pretty damning admissions. The whistleblower claims the White House attempted to cover up the full transcript of the call. This must be sounding a bit Watergate-y to you. Uh, yeah, more like Watergate on steroids at this point. I mean, 
Um, yeah, absolutely. And what's interesting here, though, is, yes, there were people in the White House, apparently, that, that sought to cover this up. Uh, but it also is obvious that there were people in the White House who were seeking to do just the opposite, that there were uh, national security professionals, such as this whistleblower, um, who sought to bring this to light. So, yeah, there was some interesting intrigue here going back and forth, for sure. During Watergate, the courts held that congressional demands in furtherance of impeachment would present wholly different considerations. In other words, Congress can get access to much more information during impeachment proceedings. Do you think that same principle still applies? Uh, no question about it. Under our Constitution, uh, the impeachment power resides solely in the House of Representatives. Uh, the only role of the Senate is to try the impeachment indictment, in a sense, the charges. Um, the courts have nothing to do with it other than to enforce uh, the House's subpoenas. Uh, and basically, the only role of the courts here properly ought to be to enforce those subpoenas to the point that if people do not turn over documents, uh, that they be incarcerated until such time as they do so. So it's a whole different situation uh, once the House of Representatives goes into an impeachment role. If Trump chooses to fight every single request all the way to the Supreme Court, like he has to date, can't he push this out past the next election? Well, I don't think it's going to happen with the matter with Ukraine because they've really got the basics of all the evidence now. I think it's a matter of putting together all the, you know, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, getting all the witnesses, getting the tape recording of that conversation. Um, I think once all that evidence is put together, it's pretty clear to me, based on what we've seen so far, uh, that this is pretty much a slam dunk case. And can you see 20 Republican senators voting to convict? Well, I think it depends on the evidence. I mean, I think you're hearing certain Republican senators now starting to split away. Uh, you heard statements by Mitt Romney. Uh, they all voted unanimously in the Senate to get the whistleblower report. Um, I think this has gone into a whole new sort of level of seriousness. I mean, the Russian matter was pretty serious. Uh, but here they've got Trump with his hand in the cookie jar. I mean, they've got him directly involved. They've got, they're going to have him on tape. They've got a conversation with a transcript, which is obviously not complete. That's why you need the tape. Um, I, I just think the allegations are completely different. And to raise the analogy to Watergate, I mean, it was very similar. The Republicans were sticking by Nixon right until the end, uh, until this smoking gun tape came out that essentially showed him uh, using, trying to use the CIA and the FBI as a foil um, to explain the Watergate break-in. So I, I think there comes a tipping point here where this is more likely to be it. And a lot of these senators are going to ask themselves, how can we explain to our constituents how we voted on this matter? And if the evidence is so powerful as I think it will be, it's going to be very, very difficult uh, for any of these senators to explain a no vote. Nick Ackerman, thank you very much indeed for joining us. OK, thank you for having me. Well, it's been a very busy show at the end of an incredibly busy week where we seem to go from about zero to a hundred in the space of 24 hours. It was like the Mueller inquiry on steroids and Chaz, it seems that instead of no collusion, we're now no quid pro quo. We it's are. much harder to say. <laughs> it is, it is. It's much harder to work out as well. Mm. I mean... The, it's, it seemed in the report, in that little tr transcript yeah. that came out... The transcript, the, which was a memo. The memo that's right, the yeah. memo. Yeah, which is, which is important because it's not verbatim. It's no, got it's some not. quotes on it. It says on the front page, caution, this right. is not a verbatim transcript. In fact, it says how long the whole thing goes for on yeah. the front page. Yeah. Half an hour yep. for five pages. So there's a yes. lot that's not there. Yes, and I guess that is going to be one of the big fights, isn't it? A bit like the Nixon White House tapes. It's going to be about getting that full phone call. But it's yeah. about more than the phone call, though. But it's also about what the phone call really meant. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, there's one moment in that phone call which really stood out to, I think, everyone, which is when uh, the... The Ukrainian president was talking about how I'd like to buy some javelins, please. They're mm. anti-tank missiles. And Trump, he says, I would like you to do me a favour, though. It's everyone, the new Russia. Are you listening? And everyone goes, oh, here we go. <laughs> but then he doesn't talk about Biden's son. He mm. talks about CrowdStrike. And mm. the thing about that is, while that seems a bit crazy, 
there is actually a Spygate investigation going on right now. So there's actually an official bit of business. Mm -hmm. So I think you can get away with that. That's not a problem. But And then they talk about Giuliani, not... Well, the Ukrainian president brings up Giuliani and then Trump talks about Biden. So there isn't a direct connection there. Mm -hmm. Some people are saying that's still quid pro quo. I personally, I don't think that's enough. Myself, when I say that, I don't think there is a direct connection there. I, having said that, we don't know what else is in the transcript. Yeah. And, we don't and know that, what Giuliani's done. He's been coming in and out. Right. He could have been doing anything. And we know that there is so much context around this, and this is the point that Democrats have been making all week. We don't have to prove quid pro quo here. Mm. You, we don't have to find that kind of a smoking gun in all of this because we know the context. The context was Trump was withholding contact from the Ukrainians. Mm. He was not having Mike Pence go to the inauguration of President Zelensky. They were making it clear that it was a prerequisite to even have the conversation that Biden would be discussed. And that's where the context is incredibly important here. But, of course, if, if we're going to have this divide, and we've already heard it from our Democrat and Republican on the show this week, if we're going to have a dig-in on this question of, mm. well, is it an overt, provable quid pro quo, then maybe, once again, we're like, well, is this conspiracy or is it collusion and is either a crime? Actually, can I, I can add something to this. Mm there might be a way we can find more information out from this phone call. Because have a look what Rudy Giuliani said on Fox & Friends. Mr Mayor, can I ask you, did you read the transcript? Uh, let's say it was read to me. Do you know what the Ukrainian told me who first briefed me on this? I couldn't get this information from our government, nor would I. It was classified. OK, so the Ukrainians made their own transcript and they, and they read it to Rudy Giuliani. Lordy, I hope there are tapes! Which means that we can subpoena the Ukrainian transcript, which might have extra information. Yep. I would if I was there. Yeah, I mean, what, what is also intriguing about this, because, of, you know, we've been focused on the, uh, on the transcript because it came out a couple of days ago, and then the acting head of the DNI, Maguire, appearing earlier today. But it seems as well this also has parallels to Watergate in that there was an active White House cover-up. People around Trump... 20 of them were on the call in one form or another. They listened to this and they thought, oh, my God, bury this. Bury this deep in a computer system that is password protected to the level of the highest level of national security, even though he is talking about getting dirt on a political rival. And the very fact that everybody freaked out and continue to freak out for several weeks, including stopping the director of national intelligence going to Congress with this whistleblower complaint... That could be where the old Nixon aphorism of, you know, it's the cover-up that gets you is proven true once again. It's hard, to point, it's hard to point that out, though, to the punter. And this is all political when it comes down to it. It's not about proving anything. It's right. about convincing people. It's a political process yeah. and public opinion matters. Yeah, and it's hard to convince people that that, that is the case. OK, all right. Shameless prediction time. Are we <laughs> going to be talking about this in six months from now or is this, is this just going to be a skyrocket that goes off and then fizzes in a week? Well, we have no idea where this is going yet because mm. remember Nancy Pelosi specifically asked for six different committees to put together their best cases for impeachable offences. So we have no idea what offences we might be talking about in a few weeks. We could be talking about taxes. We could, 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 could be talking about Stormy Daniels. Oh, we could be talking about Russia in 2016. Oh, God, no, just not that. Yeah, Please, not that. Yeah, that is all the time we have for another trip to Planet America. We're going extra. We'll talk more about impeachment. We'll talk about 2020. We even mentioned yeah, 2020 yeah. during is this an episode. election on? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's all, all over here. <laughs> See you soon. Bye.